right, welcome back to another uh, Buckeye Baseball Shop Talk. I'm Brad Goldberg, uh, as always, joined by Dan DeLucia. Uh, we are very, very excited to welcome on Josh Hellman. Uh, Josh is a former strength and conditioning coach with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, currently, he is the co-founder and director of strength and conditioning at Elite Sports Strength and Conditioning in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we are very excited to welcome on Josh Hellman. Josh, how are you? I'm good, man. How you doing? We are great, man. We are really great. Thanks for joining us. Yep. So pretty crazy times right now, a little bit unprecedented. Uh, what are you doing with your athletes um, to kind of keep guys ready or, or maintain? Or can you go into how you are going about this, uh, this kind of unprecedented time? Yeah, I mean, everything's on a kind of case-by-case basis because um, obviously you got all the guys on – kind of where they're coming from if you know they're coming in with you know any kind of uh, ache or pain or injury um, you know where they're throwing was at what equipment they have at their house um, what the plans will be for the summer that kind of thing but essentially everything is individual to them um, and then obviously this is a key time to work on you know enhancing their movement um, so obviously every one of our guys is doing an individualized movement program um, so those are the biggest things but you know just keeping in contact with guys communicating um, you know, following up on, you know, how everything's going on a regular basis and uh, just getting guys going in a good direction uh, with what they have available. Josh, what it, um, can you, for those who are just watching, kind of getting to know you for the first time, can you just talk about what you do overall um, just within Elite SC, kind of your focus, why people are coming to you? You've Clearly, you've worked with some of our guys uh, currently and in the past, and it seems you've had a, a tremendous amount of growth within your clientele, and obviously for, for good reason. So just speak a little bit about what you do. Yeah. Uh, so I'm an athletic trainer and a strength coach. Um, I worked in college and professional baseball, and essentially we just do individualized training. So clients come to us. Uh, we start with an assessment uh, where we go over and look at you know, gross movement patterns like squats and hinges and lunges and all that kinds of stuff. Um, we assess, you know, hyper and hypo mobility, um, you know, joint play and whatnot. And then we look at orthopedic range of motion, such as, you know, hip and shoulder, internal action, rotation, flexion, same thing for the shoulder. And, um, you know, those kind of things uh, to kind of develop a individualized movement program, um, which is looking to address those key areas um, that they have deficits. And then uh, we use that to kind of coordinate the strength conditioning. So, um, you know, obviously from a strength conditioning perspective, uh, there's some heavy hitters that everyone's kind of getting after. Um, but, you know, our goal is to, you know, work within their range of motion um, so that we're, you know, getting them, you know, keeping them injury free so that they have consistent training and too, so that they're feeling the right areas um, and then progressing that over time. So it's essentially what we do. And obviously, we also do the baseball specific portion of that. So pre and po post throwing program or post throw programs, throwing programs, that kind of thing. So, Got it. so within baseball, the word movement has become uh, a huge, very important word. Um, can you context to that some um, background and your opinion of why uh, and why it has become important? Yeah, I think the, the, the word movement has become a catch term. Biggest reason being is that um, you know, I think guys were looking at the, the strength curve and saying like, hey, there's these guys that are really, really strong. Um, you know, why is it that they're throwing 80? You know what I mean? Like they're, they're powerful, they're strong, and, and they're just not producing, um, you know, producing the results that you would expect as opposed to that there's guys, maybe they're springy and, um, you know, they're not as strong and not as powerful and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and they're pumping you 90, you know, or whatever. Um, so I think that brought about the question, obviously, you know, just mobility becoming more popular in the, you know, sports performance community and things like that. But truthfully, I think there's just some people who got some real good results. Um, so obviously, Eric Cressy being like the first, um, a, you know, big popular movement specialist in baseball, I think when he started having a great deal of success and, and kind of putting out the um, content that he was putting out about that he was addressing these movement limitations, I think when that became, you know, uh, out there in the community and people were starting to realize like, man, this guy's really doing a great job. I think that's when people were like, okay, we need to 
really incorporate this into our program. Um, we need to try to address some of these limitations because uh, they could you know, turn into big um, results for our athletes. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Can you, uh, I want to piggyback off that, Josh, if you don't mind, because uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty active on social media. Um, and one thing that I think people get mixed up a little bit with, to no fault of their own, is the difference between mobility and stability. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of go into the differences, maybe technically or kind of put it in the layman's terms, and then maybe some of the things that you're doing to address each one of those? Yeah, perfect. So, for example, um, stability would be you got an athlete who's a looser jointed athlete, has full range of motion in all different movements, um, but say uh, they don't, they're not able to keep good position during a movement. So, say you got an athlete who squats and they get this huge arch in their back. Okay, so people all do core core activation or core stability. Um, the stability for that would be to put them into a good position and having them become stable in that position, move them through ranges of motion where they have a stable position of their spine. That would be an example of stability. For mobility, it'd be, hey, you know, we're looking at hip abduction um, and, you know, you're not within human norms for that range of motion. So we're going to try to enhance that range of motion by doing mobility work. Um, say groin stretching or mobility exercises uh, to increase that range of motion so that you get to or close to human norms so that you can perform at a better you know, better rate. But those are the two differences. So you got an athlete who's, you know, either looser like this, probably needs stability because they're, they're looser jointed. And then you got athletes that are more, you know, tighter jointed that probably need to mobilize that joint and get a little bit looser. And then for me specifically, the mobility stability aspect, it has mostly to do with the position someone's in. So for example, say if someone is in a poor position, I'm going to use a you know movement. I, I like to use just movement, but if I'm gonna use a drill, I'm trying to put them in a better position. So like, no matter if you're, and I gave the, the stability example of the spine, but say if I'm even doing a mobility exercise, I can just have somebody just try to really crush a position. Um, but it's much, much better to have them just get a good position first and then work through the range of motion within a good position. So positioning matters. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that we're always talking about at the gym. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing with mobility stability aspect. No, that's great. So I have a kind of, you know, Goldie alluded to obviously the times we're in. So being within this uh, time range, you know, you're used to preparing guys for, you know, the high school season to start or the college season to start or pro ball season, you know, spring training to start right now, there's no finite starting date. So how are you helping guys prepare, stay engaged, and keep, um, I guess, keep pushing forward with, with goals without there being that starting point. Yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely a crazy time. Um, but I would say, you know, we're trying to keep the positivity going. We're trying to keep, you know, as far as like you know, engagement, I think we're just trying to, you know, when guys, we're trying to have them send us videos, we're trying to put it out on social media so that, you know, you know they're keeping, uh, keeping their motivation and things like that. But as far as like individual calendars and stuff like that, it's kind of a crazy time in that you know I, we were talking about that is that you know there might be guys who are going to come into you know this new season having barely thrown and there's going to be guys who are going to come in who having having thrown bullpens twice a week um so for our guys we're specifically just case by case basis like you know are you coming in with an ache pain or injury you know okay how are we going to handle that you know our potential projected start date is this right now are we going to take, you know, you know, this amount of time off to rest to try to get this to feel a little better and then slowly progress back into it? You know, are you coming in feeling great? And, you know, that could, it just depends on the person. Um, so we're just individualizing it in that fashion. But um, I just think it's uh, it's just crazy. It's it's definitely the individual um, speaking with them and kind of seeing where they're at, where they need to be, you know, what the plan is, that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's it's nuts. Yeah. Right. You seem to yeah. be – oh, go ahead. Uh, no, you seem to be talking about individualization a lot, uh, something that, you know, we do here at Ohio State with our pitchers and pretty much everyone. Um, something that that we take very seriously is, is the assessment, um, whether it's when they first come to, to school, uh, first semester, and then obviously after the semester is over and they're about to go home, and then when they come back, 
where do you see the biggest misses um, or, or maybe the things um, that are most efficient in the first time assessments when someone comes to, uh, to get your expertise? Yeah, absolutely. I, for me, this is just my, and, and a, there's a lot of people in the industry that it's kind of a too big, broad of a you know thing to take care of, but I'm big on the rib cage. Um, is the rib cage in a good position? So when people come for the assessment, you know, do you have this big rib flare in the front? Um, are you getting air in the right areas? Because that's what's going to affect your movement more than anything else I can handle. Um, you know, I got taught FMS was like the first mobility uh, movement perspective I was taught, which I still use to an extent. Um, but, um, you know, in our warm ups, we do what's called resets and then we do, you know, movement prep. The resets are the breathing drills trying to position the body. Uh, so, for example, say for that, that rib flare scenario where their lower rib cage is flared up, we're going to do exercises to have them breathe to get the ribs down and get them in a good position um, so that they can use that for feels on all their movement prep work. So, like, say if you're doing, you're doing something to enhance squat mobility and we just kind of go into that and you don't really know what positions uh, you need to be in during that exercise, the, the resets and the drills are one, to enhance joint range of motion, but two, to kind of give them feel for the movement prep work. But yeah, I would say number one thing is for sure the rib cage. I mean, especially for pitchers, like everyone's talking a lot about interrotation. It's not true for everybody, but interrotation in the shoulder, a lot of the times has to do with rib cage positioning, not as much like a posterior capsule or tightness or something like that. Like if, if you can re reposition the rib cage, that can greatly enhance interrotation or shoulder flexion. So that's, I would say that's like the secret sauce of, you know, what we do from a movement standpoint is we try to get the rib cage and the pelvis in better position, rib cage being number one. But. So just a real quick piggyback on that. Um, the, the, scap the scapula is supposed to rotate upwards and it's connected to the rib cage, right? So mm -hmm. something that I think a lot of athletes where there's a miss or a lack of knowledge is the fact that when, when, you know, strength conditioning guys or guys of your expertise talk about that, that's not just an anterior approach. That's, that's going posterior, which kind of delivers the entire shoulder, which delivers the arm. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. You got something, Dan? Go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit, and this was uh, a little bit before we started, but, um, well, I, I guess talk a little bit about just the, the range, the age range that you work with, and then I've got a question to follow up with that. Yeah, for sure. So I would think seventh grade would be the earliest grade uh, age range, you know, 12, 13 area. Um, but that has a lot to do with, you know, the, the athlete. There has been athletes like seventh graders and even eighth graders that have come in to start. They just weren't like, you know, not only – physically mature ready, but also to like mentally, like you need to be like bought in to do it, but that's about the youngest. And then obviously up to professional, but um, you know, I, I would say that's about the range. Um, and then we also work with some adult fitness clients and some other athletes, but we're 90% you know, baseball. Right. Yeah. And so I guess the question off of that is you clearly work with a large range of ages. So let's put it into even middle school, but I know you work with a lot of high school guys all the way up through pro ball. So, you know, within those age ranges, um, can you talk about a little bit of the differences that you have between structuring programs or the individualized programs? I'm assuming there's, there's, a, um, there's baselines for every age, but can you go into that a little bit, the differences between them? Yeah, for sure. So I think the number one thing, when I got started, I would literally write every single exercise, like almost completely random, mostly because, you know, I came from the athletic training world and, um, you know, it was, it was specific in that sense, but it becomes, becomes too much. And then for the athletes, what we've done is, especially for the younger athletes, the pros, it becomes completely, you know, different, but, um, for the younger athletes, we have a template that we'll use and then based off their movement limitations, or, you know, or things that they're good at. That's how we kind of structure the program that we build in the arm care and the core and things like that. But, um, you know, it, we kind of have an, a template made of like what we want a baseball player doing to develop like a long-term athletic development model um, for the whole year for, you know, beginner, intermediate, advanced, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, we kind of use that and then take the assessment and apply it to the template for the strength, conditioning, speed, and agility focus of it. Um, obviously, for baseball players with specific movements um, from a speed and agility, from a you know, strength training perspective that we're going to be working on, obviously, single leg. Um, obviously, a lot of core strength, um, you know, from a speed and agility perspective, lateral, uh, multidirectional, that kind of thing. So um, we kind of have that stuff built in, uh, you know, built out, and then we kind of tailor it to the kid. So uh, to give an example, say uh, for a kid, we're doing dynamic warm-up exercises, and we got, uh, you know, maybe a shorter kid who's bigger, broader rib cage, really flared up. We'll talk about a high schooler. And they're going to be doing a skipping series um, and say, you know, because they have that big broad rib cage, we're going to put our arms up. We're going to work on driving our ribs down with our arms up because we know that's going to help work on position. That would be a way that we can individualize it. Um, and then, you know, for a taller athlete, it could be the opposite. It could be more of a reaching component, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we're doing. But, you know, we obviously have a you know, plan together of what we want to incorporate. And then from arm care uh, core perspective, that's all going to be progressive um, based off how they move. Um, you know, going back to the ribcage example with scapular upper rotation, a big part of that is protraction. Um, and if your ribcage in a poor position, you can't get full protraction. So just teaching that kind of stuff in a progressive manner and having that built out of, you know, what are our progressions and regressions and, you know, what are going to be our heavier hitters and those kind of things. I like that a lot. I do too. So I have a um, kind of going back to the individualized program. Th this comes up a lot. And even personally for us, we talk about this quite a bit with our guys. But post throwing routines that you do with your guys, what are some things that you that you emphasize? What are kind of the vitamins you, you have guys do or the principles that you have guys do post throw? Yeah. So there's two perspectives that I learned with the Red Sox that I strongly agree with. One is that you can't get stronger in a fatigue state and you don't want to be in a fatigue state while throwing. So those are two big principles. After throwing, we can't really get stronger. So um, our big focus at the gym is focus on maintaining the ranges of motion that we know we're going to lose throughout the season. So scapular upper rotation, um, you know, shoulder, internal, external, you know, the ranges of motion that we're going to lose. We're going to do all that stuff in our post row along with, we do some deceleration catches. We do some plyo ball exercises, um, stuff like that to cool down, but we're not trying to do anything to get stronger. Like we're not immediately after our uh, throwing session doing eyes, T's, Y's for, you know, with dumbbells and that kinds of things. Um, if we're going to do any kind of scapular strengthening or rotator cuff strengthening, we're going to do that like either within our program um, or on an off day, like as opposed to the day of the throwing. Um, so that's like the biggest concept that we utilize. I would say that my business partner, Gary Stoller, does an absolutely outstanding job um, in, in coordinating doing the post drawing work. Um, I just feel like it's the, it makes the most sense to me to work on uh, maintaining, a, maintaining a range of motion after we throw as opposed to working on actual like strengthening when we're in a fatigue state. I don't think that makes as, as much sense. Um, and then obviously we are really big on mobility. So we do like some post mo uh, mobility circuits. Um, so not only work on like, you know, scapular positioning and mobility, but also to work on like, you know, internal rotation of the hips, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, depending on the person, obviously. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we're going to be doing after we throw. So one of the, the biggest questions that, that we get, and we've been to a bunch of seminars, Dan and I, is the uh, topic of running with pitchers. And I'm sure you hear it 100 times more than we do. Um, where do you stand on, on the sprints or distance, old school, new school? I think, um, I think everyone kind of wants this put to rest, but um, I don't know if it's opinion so much anymore. So I'd love to hear where uh, a guy of your level of knowledge and experience stands. Yeah, so one big thing I want to first say is that cardiac output, like your ability to have a good aerobic base, super, super important. And I don't mean that in a distance running perspective. The problem is, is that people don't have a lot of options and creativity and to get that. A lot of the, the running, the long distance running, uh, instead of doing that, they can do, you know, continuous movement circuits and get the same aerobic base being built. Um, but without having, without just doing something that would give you shin splints when you're a baseball player, which is silly. Um, which happens uh, even in college and pro baseball. Um, but, uh, but that's the biggest thing. As far as like, how do I incorporate running? We're going to do probably nothing more than a 60-yard sprint. Um, 
you know, and they just work on work rest ratios that apply to baseball. So if you're a position player and we do, you know, any kind of sprinting, so like if it's, you know, 10 yards and we're going to take, you know, quite a bit of time off, um, it's not going to be like 10 yards and come back 10, 10 yards. Like everything's just work rest ratios for baseball. Um, and then it's just, we're using a bunch of different, uh, different amounts of sprinting distances within 60 yards is what we're going to do. That's pretty much it. As far as distance running, no, <laughs> we, yeah, we won't do it. Good. Well said. Good. We all think along those lines. We're good. Yeah. Cool. What do you got there? Anything on that? That great question because we, we hear that all the time. I mean, we, we've got guys and we're, you know, we, we have camps where guys are asking us about that, but we, uh, I think our opinion definitely mirrors, mirrors yours. So that's good to hear from a guy that, that obviously has a lot more knowledge in this stuff than we do. So, yeah. um, great question. How about one, one thing? So we all went to the, uh, the pitch of Palooza that Lance Wheeler, um, you know, puts on annually. And I know there was one thing that you thought, well, at least one thing that you thought, um, really stuck out more, I think, had to do with the foot ankle uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so it was uh, Dr. Tressler, um, who's actually been pretty awesome. He's kept in good contact with us and give us some different information on like exercises for the foot and ankle. But I think it was just the big idea of like, hey, you know, everyone's talked about corkscrewing the foot for lifts, and he was talking about corkscrewing the foot for pitching, and, and something I've definitely heard of. But like, you know, a lot of times we say things and then we, we harp on it for a specific period of time and then we kind of go to something else and then we come back to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, as opposed to like, Hey, if this is something that's like really, really important, like we got to have this, you know what I mean? So like, that's kind of the heavy hitter for me. Like me and Garrett, my business partner, we, we drove home. We were just sitting talking about it. I was just like, man, like we've talked about this with kids and then you get distracted because everyone's going to ask you a question. So a kid's going to say, well, is this working right? Or is this working right? Like truthfully, like, are you anchored to the ground right first? And are you loading that right first? And I think that was the heavy hitter for me. It's not something I hadn't heard before. It's definitely something that made sense. But it was just the fact that like, hey, this is a lot of what's going on. And I think, you know, that combined with what Landon said about like eyes on the target, I thought it was just made so much sense because I've said that to young kids all the time, like, you know, I didn't have a pitching lesson all the way up into playing college baseball. And I think, you know, one big thing is that you can tell young – and that this was for me all I was told by my dad was just like look at the gloves it's like you know there's simple cues that you can give like a kid that doesn't know how to move like talk about hinges for a college athlete like they felt that like for a younger kid like they can pretty much focus on one thing like they can look at a glove like that's super super simple so I think it was just like those two were probably like two big hitters for me from the pitching development standpoint but um Dr. Tressler is awesome he just sat and talked to us for you know over an hour about foot and ankle and um, it was just something that really hit home for us and made a lot of sense. Another question that, that we get, this is kind of moving from the uh, biomechanics and moving it into the actual pitching movement, is, is when pitchers land and they go into foot strike or touchdown or whatever you want to call it, um, where, where are you on the um, foot and ankle spectrum of, of landing heel to toe or flat or landing on your toe? I know there's been a, a lot of different um, – opinions on it can you kind of uh, go into that from a kinetic change standpoint or, or where you guys are, are talking about absolutely so with dr Tr sorry my kids are outside if you can hear that um <laughs> hey, I feel you, man. yeah we're all cooped up we're all cut yeah exactly we're all <laughs> the same spot but um so dr tressler talked about that in his presentation i agree with him it makes a lot of sense so um essentially what he was saying is that the outside of the heel is going to hit down first and you're going to go into pronation um, and essentially that first, you know, instance when you're getting it, that's how you're going to get your glute as opposed to if you were to go right down into the ball of your foot, you're going to get quad adductor, which is going to, which is the opposite of what you want. So when you get the glute, that's when you're going to get that, that front leg pelvis to pull back. And that's what we're, you know, Eric talked about his presentation. He's like, it's not a block. He's, talking, he's like, it's a pullback. Like you got to get the glute to pull it back. Like for me from a rehab, well, not rehab, but like a fitness, you know, movement perspective, we're constantly talking about like glute med and we're talking about these things to try to get like the shifting and stuff of the pelvis and be able to stabilize and do things we want. Like it just makes a lot of sense. Like when you land, if you can get that, get to that muscle, like that's going to help you get to the position that you want to get to. 
as opposed to if you're just, and we talk about that all the time, like, you know, quad, you know, quad dominant athletes, hip dominant athletes, that kind of stuff. So like if you can get to the hip as opposed to the quad, um, that's going to be beneficial. So I, I would agree with him in that standpoint. Obviously there's guys that don't do that, that are very successful and, you know, and that's fine. But as far as what we're going to teach, uh, when we're going to approach that, that's how we were going to approach it. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, anything else on that, Brad? No, I, I, the more I, I research into it, and this is, I mean, we're, we're getting to interview you and we're very lucky, but uh, the more people I try to pick their brains, the more it just makes sense that if the right. heel and, and, you know, if we're going even more like in depth, the calcaneus is, is essentially the first part of the kinetic chain. Um, it, would, it would make sense to put that force vector into the ground versus landing on on your toe or, or landing on the ball, your foot, where again, your, your knee leaks. And then that that's going to cause a lot of compensations that you're going to see on the back end. So, no, I think yeah. you put it in a, in a really good light and uh, it's good to hear that some of the same uh, principles that we're researching and, and trying to relay in a pretty palatable way to our players, instead of talking about, you know, crazy force in the ground or calcaneus, you know, we're just trying to say, let's, let's try to land as flat as possible w with heel first and let's get a front hip pullback. So no, it's, it's really yeah. good to hear that. Yeah, for sure. Anything else, Dan? I have a couple more questions. Okay, I think Dan's on mute. <laughs> um, I want to I want to pick your brain on um, what you're going to see with with uh, mostly in pro ball, and I don't I'm not sure if high school is going to going to come back. Uh, do you do you think there's going to be a lot of injuries um, when when they say, all right, we're playing in three weeks, four weeks with the uh, kind of the intensity and volume that's going to come really quick from an on-ramping standpoint. Um, I know people have, have talked in the past about March and April spring training time being a really high volume injury time because guys are going back to a high volume and trying to make a team or show what they've done the off season. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on what you see the uh, injury forecast being once, so, uh, you know, God willing, we're able to play. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting time in that, you put it, you put it right in that usually in the beginning of the year, that's a big injury time. And then there's another peak, I think late middle, late end of the year uh, that there's another peak, but um, the beginning of the year is definitely the time. And I think this is interesting because during spring training, you know, they had, there's everything at a player's disposal and, and to get better and to develop and to be taken care of There's trainers. There's every, you know, thing that any soft tissue modality you want to use, there's, you know, all these different things that keep them healthy and get them better. Um, you know, and it really depends on how they bring it back. Like if they do like a full spring training or if they do, you know, that, but right now athletes are at home. Yeah. They are in contact with their teams, but they don't have as much things available to them to do the work that they were putting in, in preseason, uh, not just, you know, at the facility, at their complex, but like just in the preseason, like most athletes had a gym they were going to where they were throwing, they were doing these soft tissue things on a daily basis. They were doing all their, all their workouts, they're, you know, getting all this stuff in. They're not, you know, a lot of them probably are not right now. Uh, they're probably trying the best that they can, but they, they might not be. And I think because of the variability um, and in throwing programs and the training, like very well could see that. Obviously, we probably hope not to. Um, but I, th I mean, it makes sense that it could happen. And I think a lot of it depends on how we bring that back. I could do, you know, because like we were talking before in a little, little pre-conversation of like, you know, when guys come back, like there's really going to have to be that conversation. Like, all right, can you give me a calendar? At least this is how I would do it. Like if I was you know, a medical trainer right now with a, with a big league organization is, or a professional organization as they come back, like you're going to have to literally, I want a calendar of like literally everything you've done. Um, you know, because that's going to help you better determine like if I on-ramp them this way, like to, you know, what they're going to be doing, like what does that look like? You know, because I think there's going to be guys that, I mean, there's people out there that are throwing like live, you know, live bullpens of hitters and there's people out there that are not throwing. Like, it's kind of a crazy time. So, you know, you would think that you'd probably see some an increase in injury risk um, for sure. And then there's also the fact that, you know, you know, maybe we don't, um, you know, this could be the other, you know, devil's advocate to that is like, you know, there's also, there's a period of time now that we're not playing competitively. So the intent of throwing, like those throws are out. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there, what I said before, I think is probably the bigger factor there, but pretty unprecedented right now. So, 
Yeah. That's a good insight. point. I like that. Almost like track what you're doing in the calendar. What we try to do is get give guys a schedule going forward. But again, with no finite right. date, I think that's tough. That's a great almost looking back and say, what have you done to assess? That's a that's a yeah. Another question for you, Josh. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're if you're just a, a regular athlete at home, okay, Same. and you're following protocols, um, you're you're social distancing, you're quarant- you're in quarantine. Can you give a, a couple examples of some things that that you would recommend? Whether it's uh, body weight stuff, obviously, is probably going to be incorporated. But if you can get creative um, for for people listening at home, some ideas to to stay moving around or, or baseball specific ideas, without giving too much of your uh, of uh, elite's uh, special sauce out? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I would say the biggest thing to work on right now is, my kid just walked through the door. Uh, the biggest thing to work on right now is this movement variability. I mean, it doesn't take weights to do that. I mean, majority of people have something, some kind of deficit in order to work on. Um, and not not to, you know, plug what we do, but, um, you know, getting with somebody that can write you an individualized movement program during this time is a pretty awesome thing that you could do. Because, I mean, Without, like, again, like, if, say if you're at home and all you got is a, a backpack and some books to put together for some lunges, you know, okay, or we'll just put a b- bunch of volume together there. But if you could take that time and work on, like, you know, work on your shoulder range of motion if it's poor or you could work on, you know, your core strength if it's poor or your hip mobility if it's poor, or things like that. Um, I would strongly recommend, guys, not to just jump on the internet and look for, you know, any mobility exercise out there that they could try. I mean – I, I would sometimes say better than something, something's better than nothing. I'd say it's better on the strength conditioning perspective. If you have no equipment that any body weight exercise from a strength perspective is probably going to be okay. Um, but from just mobilizing everything, like there's some guys that should not do that. There's some guys that should. Um, so I would just, I mean, there's enough information out there to put together a decent little program for somebody, but I, I, I would work on your movement variability. I think that's the biggest thing. I think if you're moving well, um, you're going to perform well and hopefully stay injury free. That's the biggest thing. And I would also piggyback on some stuff that's been put out there by a couple of really good strength conditioning professionals and that, you know, you're not going to lose your, 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 um, your peak strength as fast, but you are going to lose your explosiveness. So you can do some reactive stuff. So like, you know, some, some jumps some you know, if you have access to a med ball, some med ball throws, that kind of thing. Um, you know, just to keep that up too, I think that would be good. Um, those are some good things to keep up with. Um, definitely. I mean, I would say if there's one strength conditioning exercise that I would definitely keep up would be a lateral jump. That would be the biggest thing I'd do. I'd work on your hydens or your lateral jumps. Um, be a good time to increase that right now because that doesn't require any equipment. Awesome. That's great insight. Yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff. Cool. I, I had one goal. Do you have any more questions? I just had one last thought. Question. No, go ahead. Okay. So I apologize. My internet's in and out right now. Um, so I guess, you know, people come to you and it, and it sounds like, you know, you're, you're telling them that movement variability is obviously the key right now. And um, for people who, who don't know what that is, I guess if someone comes to Josh Elman and comes to Elite SC, you know, what, I guess, what are you telling them that sets you apart um, from others? Like what, what has, helped you with that influx of athletes coming to you? Well, I guess, what is that that sets you apart? Yeah. So one thing I definitely know is I talk too fast and talk too medically sometimes. I <laughs> like to show people. Uh, that's the biggest thing. I like to show people almost immediately. So like, say if I, you know, going back to the movement variability, three big things, you know, can you overhead squat? Can you touch your toes? Uh, can you lunge with stability? I mean, if you can do those three things or, you know, add getting your arm overhead, can you do those things? You know, and then, you know, immediately, like, show some immediate results. Like, hey, you know, uh, say some of the hamstrings appear tight. Uh, you know, you're laying on the table, you bring the leg up, and the hamstring looks tight, whatever, straight leg raise. You know, can I give them right now in front of mom and dad one exercise to make that better? You know, and if I can, I'm going to do it. Or, for example, say if they're, they're throwing arm shoulder flexion, like their ability for their arm to go overhead, um, if, if that's poor, a lot of times I'm going to fix that right there or try it. I'm going to do something, some kind of exercise to get that better. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to show mom and dad, like, 
all right, we just gained 35 degrees or 40 degrees in the shoulder range of motion in one exercise. Um, that is something we're going to do on a daily basis. This is how we kind of run our program. There you go. Like that's like, I try to, I try to show people just cause I, you know, you can sit and talk like, and I've, and I've worked in a bunch of different places over the years and that have done a great job, uh, but the assessment sometimes becomes, and I hate this word, but it becomes like eyewash because it's like you come in and you know, you just tell them a lot of things and then, you know, come in and like, and then everybody's doing the same thing. Um, you know, we try to just, you know, show them, like, I'm going to show you what we're going to do. And I try to call parents and let them know like, Hey, these are the things that your son or daughter has done. These are the things that they've gotten better at. Um, like say from a mobility perspective, there's some that like, like you can't touch your toes, like you best bet. I'm going to write that down and we're going to come back to that after a month or two. I'm going to call and tell mom and dad, like, Hey, you know, they went from being four inches from the ground and now they're, you know, touching their toes. Like that's, that's like big deal stuff. And then same thing from a strength conditioning perspective, if, if their lateral jump for a baseball player got, you know, a foot and a half better, like I'm going to call and tell them that like, those are the big things. Like I like to show people stuff. Um, you know, as opposed to, and you guys and I can, you know, sit and talk about this stuff literally all day. And, and sometimes it sounds like I'm, like I'm crazy, but, um, but it's, it's, uh, that's the biggest thing, just showing people, you know, if I can show you something, it doesn't matter what it is. Like people, a lot of people don't care what it is as long as it works. Like, you know, just show them something that's going to work. And that's the biggest thing. Absolutely. I think our, our guys that, that are, you know, that train with you can, can definitely back that up. Um, I think that's a valuable part of what you've done for them in particular, but obviously all your other athletes. So. Yeah, thank you. Josh, anything? where can, uh, where, where can people yeah. find you on social media? Yeah. So, uh, train elite SC on Instagram, Twitter. Um, and then I'm on Instagram and Twitter as well at, uh, josh.lm and I think it's for both. Um, and then, uh, I think we got Facebook, but <laughs> don't use it as much, but I think we got Facebook too. Um, for, I think it's training elite SC. Need to get better at that one. There you go. Well, we, uh, we appreciate you coming on and thanks for sharing some of, uh, your knowledge and insight at this, uh, this crazy time. So thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, man.